Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Marathi, and here at the Surface Navy Association's annual conference and trade show, the number one gathering of the United States Navy's surface force leaders, as well as senior leaders from across the service. Our coverage here is sponsored by Huntington Ingalls Industries, General Electric Marine, uh, Leonardo DRS, L3 Technologies, and we're also a media partner uh, with SNA on this great event. And we're honored to have with us one of the stars of this show, Rear Admiral Ron Boxel, who is the Director of uh, Surface Warfare. Sir, it wouldn't be SNA if we didn't have an opportunity to talk. Thanks very much for the time. Uh, thank you, Vago. It wouldn't be the same for me if you didn't have this time. Uh, I, I always uh, always enjoy it. Um, first, I want to uh, start uh, a little bit about uh, the, the incidents and accidents in 2017. Uh, I know that a lot of that work is being done uh, uh, you know, we talked to the VCNO about uh, some of the changes. Admiral Brown was very articulate uh, about that as well, about some of the changes uh, that are happening. I know that you're uh, on the requirement side of things. Talk to us a little bit about your role in sort of addressing some of the challenges and shortfalls. I know you have a huge training portfolio piece of it that that, uh, uh, that goes into it. Uh, there is a little bit of a material and systems piece of it. Talk to us about your role in sort of rebuilding the capabilities uh, of the force and addressing some of the challenges that we face. Sure, Vago. So as you have heard, I mean, one of the big issues with this, you know, the collisions, they've caused a lot of introspection and, hey, do we really give the best training and the best fidelity trainers that we can do? Uh, do we have the best radars and systems? You know, as you know, as you look at those incidents and accidents, we put a premium on the quality of command and in the commanders. Uh, but we also took a step back and said, we need to look at make sure those commanders have all the tools we can give them to ensure that we give them as much as we can to do as good as they can so that the ships are safe and their, uh, the crews are you know, confident in their abilities overseas. So as we went through, one of the immediate things that we looked at were you know, are the quality of the radars, uh, are the quality of the trainers themselves. You know, what are we doing, how much time we're giving them, the types of things that we're doing. That's not in my lane really, but at the training side we said, you know, we were doing um, some of the scenarios that we were running were, were kind of outdated, you know, we didn't really capitalize on the fact that a lot of these ships are operating in a much more dense, uh, concentrated environment. And so we've moved a lot of those scenarios into higher stress uh, shipping situations to complement the warfighting training that we're getting. So between us, one of the biggest things that's coming out is the Maritime Skills Training Program, which is increased fidelity and quality of trainers on the waterfront in San Diego and Norfolk and also up at SWAS. So you're going to see a, a vast improvement in both the, the type of training, the quality of the trainer, and the reps and sets that they'll get to do. And so uh, between in, you know, increased and in accelerated investment in better radars uh, you know, and, and just the training itself, those are the immediate really uh, high dollar investments that we have you know, coming right out of you know, we already started in 18, we're doing it again in 19, and we'll, we'll continue to follow that up through the next few years. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, in your remarks that actually LCS uh, crews are showing better ship handling, handling character, uh, better ship handling skills, in part because they have the higher fidelity uh, trainers. So there's actually a direct link between the investment you're making and those shoreside installations and, and folks' ability to drive their ships. Well, we think so. We're going to keep looking at the data as we improve the fidelity of trainers across everybody. If it works for the the LCS, we think so it'll work for everybody else because they do have better trainers. They just, you know, they're a newer class of ship and, and we designed that training for the blue gold concept or the multiple crude training. Right. And in doing that, we've learned that, you know, they also get more time. You know, there's on haul and there's off haul. When they're off haul, they have time to train, which is equally as important. Time becomes a critical factor in all this, not just the quality of the trainers. If you have the best trainers in the world, you have time to train, it really doesn't matter. So we're looking at that. Uh, the, the last thing I can say that with LCS is that um, we don't know if it's all because of the trainers or the fact that as they get out there, they have smaller wardrooms and so they're getting more, you know. Sets and reps. Per, sale, per, per officer of the deck that's driving. There's fewer officers of the deck, same amount of time, they're going to get more time per person. So uh, that's part of this as well as to see, uh, you know, we're, we're interested to kind of keep digging down and see what's causing that because we want to take whatever model's improving and, uh, and take it forward. But certainly the fidelity of the trainers for me, when I walked in there, I said, you know, you can pull someone right off that trainer, put them right on the ship, and there's a very, very short period of time before they're proficient. Uh, very interesting feedback from the commanding officers. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, extraordinary. And also standardization on ship control panels, is that going to be something that's going to be investment as well? Because there was some confusion uh, about 
rudder position and other things. Do you think there's going to be a greater drive towards standardization on that? Yes, one of the things that we have done is we've created uh, a tech warrant holder, which is someone who basically wakes up every day thinking about commonality of bridge equipment and the quality of bridge equipment. So uh, we're very excited about you know putting that back into our portfolio. Usually it's done by class. We've said, no, we want everyone across any classes to, you know, to have a common bridge control system they look at. If you're on a frigate, you're on a future destroyer, we want it to all look the same. We've also looked at some of the, um, you know, the consoles themselves, and in, in the quest to get technologically improved, uh, we want to make sure that you know, if, if you know, people don't usually drive by, uh, by panels and pushing buttons, we drive like this with a car, uh, we drive, you know, using a stick and a, uh, 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 you know, to, so there's physically something there. Right. Uh, we're looking at whether we should put that back and make sure that, uh, you know, someone driving a ship gets the feel of driving a ship as well. And sometimes you may not see the the numbers change or, you know, maybe the the button go up or down. Uh, we saw. I I would liken this to the first time you or I went from uh, an analog speedometer to the first time someone put one of those you know, digital things on your, it wasn't quite the same. And so we're looking and seeing, you know, doing the human factors piece to ensure that uh, the people driving the ships get that feedback linkage, which makes them most productive and most good at their job. And, and that was obviously a factor in the, in the McCain uh, incident where folks didn't know, uh, or weren't quite sure what, the, what, what the, the, the discrepancy between the indicator and where they thought the rudder was. Yeah, again, um, they had history of, uh, you know, again, a history of, of looking at a certain way, and it was relatively new equipment. And so, yeah, we don't, you know, we're looking still at whether, how much of that was a factor or not, but right. um, regardless, we are looking at whether we can improve the quality, and that's really what we're focused on. Um, let me ask you a, a quick LCS. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long saga, it's a, it's a long story. Um, I remember Admiral Harvey uh, now going back almost 10 years ago saying, hey, we're going to deploy it. Uh, I know the entire Navy leadership team has talked about it, you talked about it, hey, this is going to be the, the, the breakout year, in part from the program, we, we heard that from Admiral Brown as well. Talk to us a little bit about how the mechanics of this, what's going to be happening, what we're going to end up seeing, uh, because uh, there, 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 is, there isn't a conversation I have with a surface warfare uh, officer or a surface warfare leader that does not at some point uh, lead to the word, uh, the, the initials LCS, so I, I feel it incumbent to have to ask you this question. Well, yeah, we have every intention, and that was the plan. I mean, we, the, the delays in 18 were really a function of the reorganization that happened the year before. Uh, we did the big LCS review. We did an upheaval kind of in the operational approach to employing LCS. We went from having them kind of both variants on both coasts. Uh, we've gone to a you know one variant on one coast, one on the other, with an anti-submarine warfare and anti-surface warfare and a mine warfare division on each coast. So that organizational structure you know, we're priming the pump right now to, to make it sustaining. Uh, we just commissioned our 16th LCS, Wichita, last Saturday. And in doing that, you, you're going to see these coming out about four per year. And so once this pump gets primed, and we think it's going to be fully primed and ready to deploy on schedule in 19, as, as the fleet commander has stated, uh, then they're going to come fast and furious, and those ships will be out there and ready to operate. Um, you know, I don't want to go back to what, you know, there are a lot of reasons why, uh, you know, there was a lot of anti-LCS sentiment uh, now that the ship's out there and operating, the fleet commanders, not surprisingly, want the ship out there. You know, we're going to outfit that ship with the Naval Strike Missile. Uh, we, we awarded the contract last year. We're going to do everything we can to get that on one of those deployments in 19. I don't know if we can or not, um, but it's really important to get that type of capability out on a ship that size. It's, a, it's really a, a, a huge improvement in warfighting capability. Also, we're going to be deploying the Detroit, uh, we believe, with the uh, na uh, surface uh, mission module, the, uh, you know, the, this is that new module as part of the surface mission package that will give her a great capability against small boats and uh, we're, we're excited to put that deployed forward on 19. So it's not just getting them out there, it's getting them out there with relevant capability and things that the warfighter needs. Uh, we have had, um, you know, we're still learning with LCS, we've made dramatic changes, I think everything has moved in a positive direction. We've already seen the benefit of the training in LCS and so I think, um, you know, we got to take uh, some of the stories we've heard about LCS and give it a chance to kind of uh, prove itself as we're very confident it will. Um, uh, talking about improving capabilities, uh, FFGX, the future frigate, is, uh, is also a topic of hot conversation. Uh, requirement this year, down select uh, next year, uh, very robust uh, competition. Uh, Huntington Ingalls, uh, one of our sponsors, is one of the competitors. Uh, but so are the two uh, littoral combat ships uh, are in the mix uh, there. Fink Contieri, uh, who sponsored us uh, last year, uh, was, was there uh, as, as well. Um, 
talk to us a little bit, you know, Dave Johnson, who we talked to at the time, who was the military acquisition deputy, who now has a beard and works for L, uh, L3, uh, another one of our sponsors, um, had, had sort of jokingly said, hey, look, billion dollars is the requirement, uh, but yes, you know, we wanted to have good anti-submarine warfare and, and be that kind of flexible frigate. Can you give us a little bit more granularity about what this requirement's gonna look like, and what are some of the LCS lessons learned that will go into the ship and how this ship paves the way for the future from a commonality uh, perspective as you look at a couple new generations of larger surface combatants. Sure, uh, when the CNO tasked us with going to a, a new frigate from the LCS, he said make it more lethal, make it more survivable, uh, make it competitive, uh, open competition, including foreign designs built in U.S. shipyards, and get it on contract in 20, those were the rules. And make it cheap, enough to buy well, in numbers. He didn't say that, um, but it was certainly implied, and I certainly took it that way, and as, and as we see that where it fits into our structure, we see that as the low and the high-low mix, right, of a, of, a, of a structure where large surface combatant, small surface combatant, and then you'll have unmanned, which is even you know, lower, less expensive, but you know, good capability. So the frigate, we said, okay, what can we do to really learn from uh, LCS, and we took the mission packages right off. The surface and ASW mission packages, we kind of crossed over and said, hey, those are the capabilities we want on this ship right off the bat. We looked at the radars and we said, if we're going to make this more uh, survivable platform, we need to put something that looks like our best quality radar that we have out there, which is the Spy 6 radar, and we're going to downsize it to the frigate. And in doing that, we get commonality between radars. We also said, let's make it lethal and survivable. That means putting weapons on there that can do what we need it to do to strike long range and or defend if we need to. So we put VLS, vertical launch system, 32 cells on there, uh, which we think is going to give it a lot of striking capability and also the ability to defend itself. So now you have VLS, common with our other platforms. You have radar that's common with other platforms. And the re remaining piece of the commonality trinity is the combat system. And so we're going to uh, already use the combat systems that we know, ACB 16, uh, baseline 9, whatever we're calling it in the future as we go to one single integrated combat system, we will want that to be a direct drop onto the frigate uh, to ensure, again, we have commonality in training, uh, commonality in, uh, so it won't have the you know, capability with as big a radar, it won't have the capacity with as many VLS, but other than that, it has almost all the same qualities that you see at sea today on our DDG Flight 2 Alpha ships, which is you know, pretty, pretty good capability. And so if we can complement some of those other capacity things, maybe with unmanned, maybe with uh, other platforms, then we think that's a great platform to get out in the lots of places in the cost point that we think is valuable inside the larger uh, infrastructure. So as far as what the cost is going to be, we'll wait and see. It'll go, we'll put a request for proposal out this year. We'll get the contract on contract by FY20. Um, but we, we're very excited about the competitive space. We've worked with industry to collectively uh, look at what's driving their costs and see if we can uh, mitigate some of those to have this this give and take between what drives cost and what we need for capability. And when it comes in for the time to award the contract, we think we're going to be uh, in a space that's competitive, uh, cost effective, and um, you know will be a good balance for uh, getting us more ships in the same amount of SCN. Um, do you uh, see the frigate program, uh, the Navy has a history of sort of picking programs that are uh, reinvent both how it buys something but also how it does business, right? MQ-25 is a good example of it, that the new carrier refueling aircraft is going to advance how the Navy acquires systems, but also change the game on how uh, carrier aviation delivers uh, capability. On the frigate program, it was sort of always understood that it may be a game-changing program. How do you see that? Because the original intent was, hey, let's throw the door open, let's change how we do business as we go through it. But it, depending on who you talk to in this competition, there are some folks who are like, you know, the, the Navy is still, you know, you, you made a joke about it a little bit about USS Princeton, mm -hmm. first screw propelled ship, but it looked just like a regular uh, ship because, because the Navy, you know, knows what works and devolves to, uh, you know, what works, right? Going back to a helm, mm -hmm. uh, we're not going back to a total separate Lee helmsman, right? right? But it's like, hey, we know that and we, we know it works. How do, you, how do you do the trade-offs on this? Is this program something can reinvent the way you do stuff change your, the way you do uh, logistics, change the way uh, that you, you do the mission based on the technology that may be resonant in some of these uh, ships as opposed to doing it the way the Navy, you know what I mean? It's like somebody may come with a novel idea, but you're going to execute it the way you always did as opposed to executing it differently. So to answer your question, uh, really we are doing something very different. If someone could say that we changed the requirement 
and worked with industry to get something on contract in that short period of time, that's a very different model. So, so the front end model is dramatically different. And then you start looking at, okay, well what are we doing differently inside to look at capability? Uh, every time we you know, start a ship, we create a requirement, we, we throw it over to the acquisition side and we say, here, go figure this out. And then they go, they open up their book and they do it the same exact way. Well, we didn't do it the same way this time. Uh, as we went through, we found uh, you know, e examples of what we wanted in our book that we do it all the time. This is the survivability want. This is how you get it. And when we looked at that book, we said, well, does that make sense? These ships are already built. Are we going to change the way? Let's look at the way they did it. Uh, do you achieve survivability? in a way that will work for us or not. And we assess those. Sometimes we said yes, sometimes we said no. Because we don't want to, you know, if we're going in a competitive space with ships that exist, it's counterintuitive to go and say, well, let's dramatically change that so you can meet this requirement that never changes. And so we did look at that. We had something called the Frigate Affordability Board that we created between requirements and the acquisition side. We'd have industry come in and say, hey, we think this requirement, we meet it. We don't meet it the way you say it, but let's show you why we think our way will work. And we say, okay, lay it out there. And we, they bring it in, and we would review that, and we would value the risk and cost associated with changing that, and sometimes we accepted it, sometimes we didn't. About half of them, more than half, we, we accepted. So that's a new way of doing business. And so the risk piece of that has both a cost risk, you know, what does it cost to change, and an opportunity risk. Uh, if, if they may be doing it in a better way that we didn't look at. And so uh, that's a different part of it. So I do think that we're changing. Again, the, the wheels of progress move slowly, uh, but I think in this great power competition, the CNO's challenged us in his design 2.0 to go after every one of those things. He's using it by timelines. He's using it by giving us the flexibility to create these new processes. The requirements evaluation team is the swarming tactic. We didn't do it that way before. It was a serial process, slow, and every you know, every, there was an opportunity cost for going slow. The capability got delayed, and the adversary moves ahead while we stay, stay the same. Um, let, me, let me ask you about uh, large uh, surface combatant. Uh, you know, you said volume uh, and power uh, are, and cooling are sort of the key characteristics, right? You want to create a good bus that can be used for a variety of uh, different applications. Can you fill that out a little bit? You want to get that ship under contract in 23. I think you want to have the requirement out year after next, if I'm correct uh, on that. Beyond just saying, hey, it's going to be a big bus that can carry a variety of different things. You know, you said we may no longer do a cruiser, right? That's something which is which is novel uh, and, and under discussion. We may want to have larger uh, missile tubes as we do on the Zumwalt class that can carry a different uh, generation of far longer range uh, uh, weaponry potentially. You you even mentioned VP, if I got it correct, v Virginia payload module compatibility. Was that what you were suggesting with uh, the submarine force? Talk to us about some of the other ways you're thinking about this ship and some of the other characteristics you want that go beyond just sort of power cooling and, and volume? Well, you missed the two most important aspects, which are flexibility and adaptability. Those are the two primary reasons we need a new ship. I mean, we've got a big radar on the DG Flight 3. We've got, you know, a lot of power, not we'd like more. We don't have the ability to be flexible and adapt and change. That ship is very densely packed because we've taken this hull and we've put more and more on it to the point where we've pretty much maxed out the footprint. So that's the swap C piece. We can't, we're not going to be able to put a larger VLS on there if we decide to do so. Uh, and, and if we do put a larger VLS on something, we want to make sure it's common. You know, if the submariner is going to use something, we want to look at that model. I'm not saying that's what we're going to do, but if there's an investment in how they're doing it and it fits for surface ships, then we're interested. What we are most interested in ensuring that if we have a bigger missile on our ships in the future, uh, I don't know what that looks like, but I don't want to design a ship without that ability to put that in there. So to me, uh, the, the, the volume, swap C, cooling area, uh, that's good, that's important, but flexibility and adaptability. In the new space that the CNO talks about, des design 2.0, of going faster, high velocity learning, we don't know what the capabilities we're going to need, so it's best to build it with the idea of being able to build to whatever you need, rather than saying, uh, you know, hey, well, this is what we think today, and we're going to have that for 45 years. So that's really the, the key part that I think is most important to large surface combatant is the flexibility and adaptability. But of course, you know, we're changing off the DG Flight 3 because the capabilities we need on our large surface combatant, we, we think there's going to be a need for more power, which will mean, you know, ships grow in three dimensions when you, when you put generators or whatever on there. And so th those are, the space will become important, but creating the, you know, 
de-densifying the ship. I don't know how you say that, but uh, putting more area in there right, right. And, and at the same time making sure it's survivable. So those are all things in the, that are consideration in the space. Um, unmanned, um, the surface force has always been interested in sort of unmanned platforms. Uh, things like Wave Glider have been part of the force actually for a long time in, in terms of sort of sea surveillance. Uh, you put a, a slide up there that had a big ship uh, with the word unmanned over it and some folks thought you were going to be driving bigger ships around. Walk us through a little bit of the unmanned surface roadmap in terms of the capabilities you want to deliver to the surface force, whether it's for uh, surveillance and, and whether payload or other kinds of applications, uh, given that your requirements are a little bit different from the dull, dangerous, and dirty, for example, that the submarine force uh, consistently talks about. Right, I would say that you know the, the thing that we add is is we want more platforms, more capability distributed. So, you know, dull, dirty, dangerous, and distributed is not a bad mantra for us on the surface side. I would also say that, um, you know, the whole purpose of going to something smaller isn't just to make it cheaper. Uh, if, if, you know, if we can do it better uh, in a way that, that uh, gives us the capability, then that's what we're looking for. Uh, if you remember yesterday I talked about really things that go on surface ships fall into sensors, command and control, and payloads. Uh, so we're looking at the whole force's ability to do that. Big payloads, big sensors, big command and control on the big ships. At the small side, maybe you're getting one or the other. Maybe you get payloads on the large, maybe you get sensors on the small, maybe you do a little bit of both on either. Uh, but again, that's the work that we have to do to find out what's the right balance. Uh, and you know, if these, some of these large unmanned, in the near term, they may actually be manned, or as we like to call them, optionally unmanned. We'll, they'll be manned today, but maybe not tomorrow. Uh, while we think through the concept, get out there and operationally experiment with these sh vessels to ensure that they are meeting what we want them to do and also using it as a platform for innovation to go out there and say, if we put these with these squadrons, experiment and let people try them, people that are a lot younger and, and more uh, attuned to what technology brings them are going to be more likely to change that platform for their next few generations, not mine. Let me, if I may, I know you're, uh, you've got to run, but on training, um, the, the idea of embedded training, right? We have the on-demand trainer, that's uh, game changing, it's on display here, it's a Lockheed Martin uh, uh, product, uh, in terms of being able to do um, more integrated shoreside and adaptable, right? Instead of a $300 million facility, you can move this around, and now there's increasing talk about, hey, embedding this kind of capability in the ships themselves, mm -hmm. so that whether you're at pier side or anywhere else, you can have these sort of much broader interactive uh, kind of fleet-wide exercises, because everybody's interested in experimentation, right? So your security requirements go up, and, and there are a whole bunch of challenges associated with it. How, how soon before we have these sort of embedded capabilities in the way that I think, uh, and everybody talks about needing, but we're still sort of in this extraordinary bridging period where naval training is, is really going through an incredible transformation. Like, you know, what, what's the map to sort of get us to the sorts of things that you, when, when you were driving a ship, were like, boy, I wish I had this resident on my ship and I didn't have to go through to a shoreside trainer. Yeah, so I could spend an hour talking to you, I won't, uh, but. I'll be here for an hour to talk yeah. to you about it, but anyway. Uh, the, uh, the, the exciting thing for me is that, you know, the things we're doing today, this isn't something in the future, it's today. We've already got operational trainers that can do everything at sea using a virtualized combat system, taking the same operational program that we have today and operating it in the training environment. We're, you know, so if you do that today, then the obvious tomorrow is to take that capability and put it at sea on the ships. If we put the virtualized environment on the ship, we want to make sure the functionality to self-train, like we have with Aegis today, but not to the level of fidelity, and not, it's not up to date as quickly as we'll be able to do this with a virtualized system where we can update the software literally while you sleep, like you get it on your iPhone. So that's the future we want to go to. Now, from here today to there tomorrow, we will need some sort of kind of uh, gap filling capability. I don't know if that's you know some onboard, uh, on the peer trainers, if it's going to be uh, schoolhouses that we, you know, we fill in with these, or some combination. That's kind of probably what it will be, some combination of of gap filling, uh, but interestingly, we just tested for the first time, we used this SIAT trainer, this combined integrated air missile defense, ASW trainer, uh, which is in effect today in San Diego. Uh, the Rafael Peralta is the first ship to go through it. The feedback was eye-watering. What we could do and the fidelity of the training and what we were able to do there far exceeds what they can do even on our most capable, newest Aegis DDG Flight 2 Alpha ship today. So. That excitement is going to generate 
more excitement, which will create a demand that you know we see it coming, but uh, I don't think we can keep up with the pace. Um, so we're going to go aggressively, trying to build more innovative trainers like Syat. Uh, we're taking parts of that and moving it up to Dahlgren, moving it to the waterfront, moving it to Swass, um, and but yet on the piers, that's where it matters the most. For the ships that have that most capable, which isn't all of them yet, um, you know, as, the, as we start getting more baseline nine Aegis ships out there over the next few years, that's going to dramatically increase. When that happens, we're, the training demand will also increase. And so that's the future we're shooting for. And we're going to go heavily into that type of training uh, because it's a very huge return on investment for the quality improvement in training for a dollar. And the sailors love it because it's what they're it's what they're used to. They want to see this in real time. They're not going to be happy with uh, a mismatch between what they're seeing in their trainers and what they're seeing in real life because they live in the gaming world. And frankly, that's, you know, that's, that's what we need to do. Coolest trainer with the bulkiest name. Yeah. Rear Admiral Ron Boxel, Director of Surface Warfare, the N96 Sir. It's always a pleasure. Thanks very much. And, and uh, break a leg and looking forward to talking to you again at Navy League uh, for another update. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Vago. See you.